Welcome back, everybody. Our next speaker is up. Nick Sieber. Hey. Nick Sieber. Hey. Nick Sieber. Hey. This is so weird. Um, all right. Hi. Uh, my name is Nick, and the name of this uh, presentation is A Brief History of Reperformance. And that's what it's about. Uh, it's a very brief history, in this case, the fun of crunching a 100, 100 page paper into a 20 minute presentation. So if, uh, right now I'm a little bit deep in the in the tall grass. So uh, I've tried to like simplify things a lot. So I may have dropped things that are required to make sense of certain parts of this. So if I, anything doesn't make sense, or if you want more detail, let me know. Uh, I erred on the side of simplicity with the hope that stuff would come out in the Q&A if you really wanted it. Um, so I'm interested in music reproduction. Um, and in the standard way, of thinking about it now, we sort of have had two ways of reproducing music. Uh, the first uh, is with performance, with music notation and performers. If you want to make a piece of music happen again, you have a performer and a score, and they do what the score says. And now you have the piece of music one more time. And the other way, which I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with, uh, is with speakers, uh, like this, headphones, um, that produce sound waves in the air directly. Um, and these speakers and other similar uh, technologies that vibrate little membranes uh, in the in the air, uh, vibrate little membranes to produce vibrations in the air are modeled on this, uh, which is the tympanic membrane or your eardrum. Uh, and so Jonathan Stern calls these kinds of technologies tympanic uh, reproduction. So they're based on the, the tympanum, the human eardrum. Um, so a lot of the way that we talk about sound and reproduction and sort of related issues is based on this is based on, makes, sort of makes sense, based on the ear, based on technologies that are based on the ear. Uh, so what I'm interested in doing is looking at a different kind of reproduction, a kind that's not the dominant, not the successful, not the current, um, but an older, obsolete, residual, all of these great sort of marginalizing words. Um, and specifically for the, for the purposes of this presentation, um, I'm going to be looking at this machine, uh, Edwin Scott Bode's 1897 Pianola, which is a machine that plays your piano for you. Um, if you look up here, uh, patent diagrams are great. The white and black line up there, number eight and nine, that's a key on a piano. So you stick this thing up in front of your piano. It's got 88 fingers with um, little felt tips on them, and it presses down on the keys. You put your feet on this pedal and you pump it, um, and that makes the keys go. Um, and what actually sort of directly makes the keys go uh, is that this piece of paper with holes in it rolls over a bar that also has holes in it. Um, and when the holes in the paper line up with the holes on the bar, then a vacuum pulls through and the corresponding note gets hit. So now you know exactly how player pianos work. Um, it looks sort of like this. In general, I think I used this in my last presentation. This woman is playing the pianola, which is playing her uh, piano for her daughter. Um, and so she's doing stuff with her hands that will become important later. So before I get into the ugly details of this, this is fun. This is a ghost, ghost hands. Um, I want to sort of get at the question which is sort of inherent in a lot of this historical work. Why do we care? Uh, why do we care about a strange machine that's invented over 100 years ago um, that we don't use today and all this? What does it have to tell us about where we are now? Why would we care about old things? As if I have to explain that, that's OK. I will. Um, <laughs> uh, so I would say that the argument for why we care is because it is strange. Because it seems strange and is uncommon, um, we can discover alternative ways of looking at sound reproduction. So I think that reperformance, which is this mode of reproduction, uh, what I think reperformance offers is an opportunity to, is an opportunity to look at sound reproduction, to think about sound reproduction in unusual terms. And so a lot of the purpose of my thesis is about enabling exploration and enabling a kind of inventiveness in the way that we conceive of sound and material sound and uh, recorded sound. So the central theme of this presentation is going to be about recordings and performance, those first two modes, and bringing them together. Um, and the way that happens will become hopefully more clear. So there are two primary areas in which I think um, the pianola, well, for this presentation, there are two primary areas in which I think the pianola has something interesting to offer us about um, in this in this uh, area. Okay, so first, representation. Um, the way that performance is represented on paper, the way performance is fixed in order to be reproduced. Uh, second, reconfiguration. This is the way that performance is actually altered in order to be reproduced. So in order to make a piano performance happen again, um, you need to do something to the piano performance to change it from its original form. Um, and I'm interested in those two things, which are broadly sort of about 
well, representation and reconfiguration, but about um, perception and labor. Uh, so back to our friend, the role. This is the sort of fundamental thing about representation and the, and the pianola. And if, I know people in the grad students uh, have read this article um, by Lisa Gittleman about a 1906 court case, which is about these very things. And the question was, are these sheet music or not? Um, and there's a debate, it's all about money in the end, between um, composers and uh, sheet music publishers and music role uh, producers. And the music role producers say, this is not sheet music because if it was sheet music, they would have to pay royalties to the composers. And so they said, this isn't sheet music, this is machine parts. It's in a machine. It moves around in a machine. Um, the music role producer said, no, you can see, look, those are the notes. They go like this. Da, 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 da. So you can't read it, though, so it's not legible to humans. Um, but so the question in this in this issue, the court ended up deciding that it was machine parts, actually, which is funny, on analogy with the phonograph, um, because the phonograph is not machine music. So there's the sort of new uh, media studies axiom that we think about new media in terms of the old. This is actually newer than the phonograph. So there was a sense of making sense of this via the phonograph. Um, but so the question got then resolved the other way by the 1909 Copyright Act, which said, uh, actually, no, these are all a new kind of mechanical reproduction. Let's have a thing called mechanical licenses and force everyone to uh, to pay this little bit of money. In any case, I don't care about copyright. Um, sorry. Uh, so, so the question that I think is interesting here is about legibility. And what does it mean for something to be machine legible, and what does it mean for something to be human legible? And I think that that is a sort of negotiable, a negotiable thing. The holes are obviously machine readable in a certain way. Um, these lines on the paper are human readable and not machine readable. Um, I'll get back to them in a, in a moment. But even while the musical producers are saying things like, these are machine parts, they're doing all of this work, this hybridizing work, to make these legible to humans. So you find inventions like this, uh, which is you know printing music across the front of the across the front of the roll, so that when you when you're sitting at the piano, you can look at it and see the music, right? The music meaning traditional musical notation. There are a variety of ways to do this that chop up musical notation, and alter it. Uh, this is one. It's that one. It's, this is another one. Um, then this one brings up an interesting sort of extra step where in, in addition to showing music on the screen, they also show you what to do. This is a piano instruction role. It'll teach you how to play the piano, presumably after you've taken the thing off the front of the keys or are using one with a built-in uh, built player. So it says, you know, here's the hold that's this note, press it with your finger and so on, and an even more exciting one, which is this, which tells you how not to play the piano, but how to operate the pianola itself. And you notice the foot on the pedal is towards the bottom because you won't get very far if you don't realize that you need to press the pedal for it to, for it to continue moving. <laughs> um, so, returning back to this sort of, this thing, look, I'm gonna talk about these lines. Um, there are two lines, there's a dotted line and there's a sort of solid wavy line. Um, the dotted line represents dynamic level and would be printed on the roll because if you pedal harder or pedal softer, you can make the, the music louder or quieter. And how do you decide whether it should be louder or quieter? Oh, well, you can read uh, this sort of line on it. And what that line tells you, oh, hey, I'm supposed to get to read it, uh, reconfiguration. This, what the line tells you is you know, what to do. So the, now the roll is instructing both the machine and you in how to sort of come together and produce this re-performance of something that's already been stuck on the piece of paper. Um, what the, I won't get to the solid line just yet. So what this does is changes the interface of the piano from this, you used to need to know how to manage this thing to play the piano if you wanted to be a, a pianist, uh, to this. So now you can be a pianolist, who is someone who plays the piano. And this is what the woman was operating with her hands and what that uh, wavy line was, was showing. So these are some hand controls. You can control the uh, sustain pedal because your feet are busy. Uh, you can change the tempo. You can make the high notes louder or the low notes louder. And this varies tremendously across all of these machines. Um, but what I'm interested in at the moment is this one. Uh, this is the tempo lever with an added thing that points up. It's called the metro style because it is the metronome stylus. Uh, it changes the tempo and you track that line with it. And as you track that line, uh, the music speeds up or slows down. And the reason that you need to have this is because at the time, most piano rolls were metronomically punched, which means you take um, sheet music and directly turn it into the piano roll. So you would say if there's four quarter notes in a row, you have four holes evenly spaced. Nobody plays like that. Those would also come out evenly uh, at an even dynamic level. Like they would be exactly the same loudness. And so at the time, there's a question of how can we make this mechanical thing more human and the interesting answer at this time is with a human, 
uh, in front of it. And so what you do is you tell the human, wiggle this little stick, and the tempo will sort of go like this, and that'll sound more human, vary the dynamic level, and then that will sound like will sound more human. So reintroducing variability by actually using uh, by using a person. Um, what's really interesting about the Metro style line, though, is that they're not only just sort of drawn on there by, you know, the guy who says, now it gets faster, now it gets slower, not according to the score, but they're recorded sometimes or drawn on by experts. So a famous pianist would take this role that was a score and they say, okay, interpret this. They would take a pen and they would write on the role where they would go faster or slower. So now what the pianist's job is, now that the machine can remember the notes, the pianist's job is to say, okay, I want to say what the dynamic level is and what the, um, what the tempo is. So that's now the locus of human pianistic performance is being able to change these two, uh, these two things. So they would record it. Um, they would record it by using things like this. If you're not familiar with the insides of pianos, this may just look like the inside of a piano. Um, but the thing up there above the hammer, number 10, is a recording device that if you hit the string with a hammer, uh, that will tell you how fast you hit the string, therefore tell you how loud and then we'll mark a roll, and instead of having the holes be evenly spaced, it will be spaced according to how you play them. So it's a, they call it a hand played roll. And so this develop, this, um, this causes a very interesting phenomenon, uh, which is what you are interpreting or playing when you're on the pianola as a pianolist has occasionally already been performed. So you are playing a recording in the sort of traditional sense we are familiar with playing recordings because you probably do it all the time. You probably did it this morning before you came here, uh, you know, in some capacity, the shower or the car or whatever. Um, and so, but now what you're doing, what you're performing has already been performed one time. So there's a little bit of interesting language slippage that happens here and happens throughout sort of the rest of the thesis, uh, which points to what I mentioned before about how tympanic reproduction really organizes the way we think about, about sound and reproduction. So we know what words like playback, <coughs> interpretation, liveness, and performance mean, right? Those all have meaning. So like liveness, for example, um, music can't be live until it can be recorded. So you don't have live music until there's a recorded music that sort of produces live music. So there's a distinction between maybe, you know, improvised music and music that's been written down. I get to that in the thesis a little bit, but there's no, you know, what does it mean to be live? So live music is fundamentally based on recorded music. And when recorded music is recorded in a particular way, liveness is constructed in a particular way. So the kind of liveness that is complementary to a, to a sort of sound, a traditional sound recording, a traditional, uh, a tympanic, the kind that we do now with the speakers, um, that's one kind of liveness. But say, what does live mean uh, in, what does live mean in, in this situation, right? This guy is going to play the piano live, but he might be playing someone else's interpretation. He's being told what to do by the machine. He doesn't have to do what the machine says. So there's this sort of interpretive, uh, interpretive flexibility. And what you have is this strange overlap, uh, like I sort of hinted at in the beginning, between recording and performance, where recordings are made into these sort of objects that can be performed again. And the opposition that we have between performance and recording that I sort of casually throw out in the beginning as a way that we often think about sound, you know, live versus recorded is sort of a fundamental paradigm in how people think about music when they listen to it. Um, this doesn't make sense. So what you have at the time is confusion about this because they do have live and recorded music when the piano comes out. They have the phonograph. The phonograph has been around. Um, and so the advertisers have this question and they say, well, how, do, how are we going to sell this machine? Are we going to sell it as, hey, you don't have to remember the notes. If a baby crawled onto the pedals and started pushing, then the baby could play. Or are we going to sell it? I wish I had a picture of these ad, but I, this ad, but I couldn't find it. Um, or are we going to say, trust me on this, it says this, uh, you are not an operator. You are a player with this device. So they're trying to say, now you're not, uh, you know, you're not consuming things you are actually producing something, you're actually performing something. Um, and so in recent literature on the player piano, on mechanical music, specifically a book by a guy named Brian Dolan and an article by David Sweesman, there's a talk about de-skilling as what this is. Um, so you don't have to remember the notes. So now you have less skill, or it requires less skill to do. Um, and as someone who is in comparative media studies, you may be able to imagine where I go on this on this issue about um, you know consumption versus <laughs> versus production, um, and I'm interested in sort of reclaiming what people are doing when they're sitting at the piano, um, and so people who are sitting at the piano are doing something, and when, just because the machine becomes more complicated doesn't mean that you have to become 
less complicated in some way, you can still you know, interact. Um, but I'm interested in sort of reclaiming the performativity of recordings, which is a sort of obvious thing in this case because it's a recording and you perform it, but it's not so obvious in the case of, say, playing your boombox on the subway or in terms of, you know, putting the needle on a record. But a lot of these things sort of have, have interesting parallels. Um, so um, basically, by blending together traditional notions of recording and performance, um, we can, wait, by blending together recording and performance, we can replace or reconsider our models of skill, our models of what performance is, of what, of what recording is, um, and sort of move into the brave new world of overlappy performative performativity and recording. Now this, if, I don't know how many of you got to see the Gutenberg parenthesis um, talk yesterday, uh, but I'm gonna go out on a limb here, this is gonna be good. Um, so there is there is a structural similarity between what I'm saying and some of the points of the Gutenberg parenthesis people, um, which, is, which is to say that the idea that recording and performance are these inviolate separate things is historically local and technologically local and is only true of recording. It's not even true of phonographic recording at the beginning of it. It's true of recording, you know, from the early, sometimes the early 1900s through, you might say, like the advent of turntablism in the 70s. This don't touch the record, recording and performance are different kind of idea. But before that, when music reproduction means notation and performance, you know, reinterpreting other people's creative work as part of performance is, you know, the way that you do things. And uh, now, um, it's part of the way we do things. Again, this is part from the patent document for rock band, uh, which is like, really hard to see. Um, but this is what patents look like now compared to how they used to look. Um, yeah, so, sort of in, in conclusion and trying to lead on to questions, I think that what's interesting about reperformance is this alternate viewpoint it gives us on the way things are going now, on technologies that overlap performance and recording. In rock band, you are playing, but you're also playing things that have been recorded. And people get upset about this. People say this isn't music, this isn't performance, this isn't all sorts of things. But without considering where those terms come from, the sort of historicality of performance, actually, as something that's been defined by uh, and against recording. So I think that by sort of blending together these things, by looking at reperformance, uh, it is coming back actually in some sort of hi-fi communities. I didn't get to talk about the company that takes old acoustic recordings and turns them into player piano recordings, modern fancy player pianos, so they're better um, recordings, uh, but they're also in the thesis. But basically, this is sort of in the theme of a lot of our, uh, a lot of our presentations so far about opening up uh, room for exploration, opening up room for uh, inventiveness, and blurring the lines between categories that were previously thought to be completely uh, you know, incommensurable or distinct from each other. Um, and now early, I would just like to answer questions instead. <laughs> I downloaded it off the internet. I can give it to you later. It was a real question. That is a real question. Yes, Elliot. All right. Um, so I actually might have already asked you about this some other day, but I'm going to go for another one. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, one of the early harmonics uh, projects before they actually got into video games. Okay. Uh, they were giving a presentation and the team talked about it. That their original product was they were trying to sell a variation of karaoke machines in right. Japan, where you can actually, sort of like the pianola, where you can actually control tempo and other factors of the music, and the market, you know, then the business people just said, what are you doing? Because you can't change recorded music. Um, so I'm wondering if there's a, if you think there's a cultural factor that could prevent, you know, you're talking about bringing some of that back, mm -hmm. and not that this is dependent on finding a market, that right. sense, but is there now a cultural uh, resistance to changing recorded music in that way? I think there absolutely is a cultural resistance to changing it. And just as an example, so the, this company that I was talking about um, that takes the old acoustic recordings and turns them into the player piano things, they don't call their player pianos player pianos. They're pianos that play themselves, but they call them robotic pianos because, as the, the, the president of this company told me, it's a market disaster if you say player piano. And it's just sort of uh, goes to because player pianos mean crappy and old and all this stuff. Um, but it's sort of a similar problem where there's this ingrained idea of what 
uh, of what recordings are supposed to be. And this is where it gets a little bit Gutenberg parentheses, but like that there, these are some, somehow supposed to be inviolate, that recordings are, you know, recordings, so we don't do anything with them. But I mean, the funny thing with the karaoke example is that there was already karaoke, right? So karaoke is already about inserting yourself into the role of the singer. And I have some, some stuff in another section about the roles that are defined in this and how people occupy different roles differently and shape the roles and move in. So singing is one thing, but being the band leader is this weird, is this weird other thing. But meanwhile, no one at the moment is terribly upset about, you know, DJs and turntablism, where you are, you know, are all about changing the tempos and, and overlapping things. So yeah, there's certainly cultural resistance, but given my historical time frame, I am hitting it less than, <laughs> than I would have expected. <laughs> um, yeah, Joel, sorry. Uh, yeah, so it, I mean, I'm, I'm interested, obviously, in what you're doing for <laughs> a variety of selfish reasons, but um, I'm curious, it seems like the gesture to move towards something like the obsolete here, or the residual, um, is largely to produce kind of pragmatic or material histories of things we don't remember, right? So uh, I'm wondering if um, there's also a conceptual move, um, or if there's also a theoretical move. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just to say, like, I see the richness of what emerges in terms of how the obsolete thinks through the alternative. Are you interested in certain different models of history as a function of this? Or is this largely something about getting us to rethink contemporary media practice? Yeah, so I actually, that's, thank you for that, because there is a broad theoretical part of this that I decided what I was going to cut because I didn't trust myself to be able to talk about it in the 20 minutes. But sort of generally, um, yeah, so there's, there is this sort of theoretical angle on um, just how we perceive reproduction, but as far as history goes, like the working of history, I'm I, there are definitely relationships between this and um, and sort of uh, theoretical th uh, working on innovation and how you know new technologies come about um, that are interesting that are interesting to me in this context, and also about the relationship between people and automation. And so theoretically, that's something that comes up all the time. Obviously, it comes up in sort of in Marxism clearly, um, and Marxist alienation is something that I'm sort of dealing with personally and in the um, <laughs> context of the, of the presentation. Um, but yeah, so it's more, um, the theoretical stuff that's coming up is, is generally media history specific, just because I had to cut myself out a chunk somewhere, but it's mostly about how people relate uh, to automation and to automation, to automation and to the, specifically the automation of things in the cultural sphere. So like Marxism is great about, you know, what happens when the job in the factory is now done by a robot, but there's a different kind of attitude here about what happens when playing the piano is done by a machine. Because <clears throat> on the one hand, it seems less dire because whatever, it's only art. But, but on the other hand, it also seems more dire because art is the human. And like, what does it mean to have machines do the thing that are the human? Uh, and so, yes, yeah, so there's this kind of anxiety. That, and then so automation of Yeah, and I think specifically in the sort of anthropological angle that I would have loved to go deeper into here, how people respond specifically to automation. So may, not so much making claims about the nature of automation, what automation does to culture, or how people and automation are, but more about how do people negotiate this? Because the pianola, it exists, it's a real thing. Nowadays, people think about it like a metaphor, it's something to throw a chair at during a bar fight in a Western or whatever. But it's a real thing in people's houses at the time. And so part of, part of me is just excited by recovering historical specificity. And you get to say, hey, look, this was a real thing. It had wheels, and like you had to push it up to your piano and all this stuff. And so I think there's a, like, a lot of value just in doing that, yeah, just yeah, in yeah. sort of reclaiming the thingness of this thing. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things you talked about uh, very, uh, very interestingly is the, the change from the interface of the piano keyboard to the interface of the pianola right. controls that people face. But the other change that's going on there is also that the piano keyboard itself becomes not only an interface to people's hands, but now to a machine, which it wasn't before. Right. Um, and uh, I think this relates to some of the comments you're just making about you know, fear of mechanization of the of, uh, playing of, of the piano, but there's something different uh, about creating a device that interfaces to an existing piano and <laughs> creating a device that just plays itself. I, I'm wondering what the implications of that are. The, the piano keyboard, which you know is exclusively for the use of human piano players, uh, gets converted by the pianola into uh, you know a 
piece of a mechanical interface or linkage between one machine and another. So there, are, so there are two interesting points. I'm hopefully going to remember both of them while I talk about the first one. So the first one is just a sort of little uh, thing that relates to uh, where are you about how the, the whole thing about glomming the where are you diagram there about glomming this onto the front of the piano. There's a, a an example that I found from 1915, which is a bench that you put in front of the pianola and you plug it into the wall and it's got two little pegs that come out of the front of it and it pedals <laughs> the pianola for you. So there's obviously this, this bizarre interest in having machines that operate that operate other machines and um, an earlier sort of tack that I was taking in the thesis was to look at the pianola as a kind of reading of the interface of the piano, like a physical reading of the interface, because you look at the piano and you say, okay, what are the salient parts of this interface? And then if you look at the sort of business end of the of the pianola, you can see, you know, in inverse, what they thought was the important was the important connection here. And so part of what I blurred over in this, in trying to focus on a single device, so I didn't have to explain a million devices while I was going through this. Thank you to my CMS colleagues for. Uh, uh, getting me on that is the is the so people like to make a distinction between piano players and player piano. So this is a piano player because you stick it on the front of the piano. A player piano is a piano that has this mechanism all built into the inside, and those turn into what are called reproducing pianos, which um, specifically they they uh, automate this. So they have encodings on the side that replace you entirely by by you know moving the tempo automatically with the roll and uh, and uh, doing the dynamics on their own. Um, and so that has a really different reception, actually, the reproducing piano versus the pianola, because the reproducing piano, again, is this like listening thing. Now you can have Paderewski in your house, and he'll play you a song, and you can go sit over there, and you can just listen to him. And I think by the time of the reproducing piano, you see a little bit of this, I would call it a tympanic attitude, kind of creep in to how people relate to these machines. Because, like you said, it's no longer about interfacing two machines together, like a machine that you could have played yourself. I, you can't play the reproducing piano yourself, but it's about a piano that can play itself so well that it doesn't need you anymore. Uh, and so that's maybe where some of this anxiety comes out, where um, in in every time someone wants to say, well, there's something special about live performance, or before there's live performance, they say there's something special about extemporaneous performance. So let's capture that in a machine. And then they do it, and they go, oh no, I killed the bird, or whatever, because they like <laughs> have captured it, and now it's not special anymore, so they need to find the next thing that's special. Um, so yeah, I think that's maybe what happened with the reproducing piano. Is that it wasn't special anymore because you didn't have this <laughs> there's this like erasure of the human and there's a bit of work to try to reclaim the performativity of the reproducing piano um, in terms of like uh, uh, what do I want to say in terms of sort of experimental composition which I know people here know is a, is a <coughs> fancy of mine I wish I had that as a sound example now because it was funny that I had no sounds in here but it would have been tympanic anyway so it would have been not <laughs> as legitimate <laughs> Um, but, but yes, yeah, so there are examples where people take the reproducing piano and say, what can we do with this that humans can't do, and then sort of move from there. And then it's sort of liberatory as opposed to this like crushing, alienating kind of thing. So it's a weird question of attitudes, I think. Yeah. I think it, uh, I mean, it, I keep thinking of the Turing test and, you know, the whole question yeah. of uh, can you actually fool somebody into thinking something is real that is actually automated. And I'm wondering if we get into any discussions of automation and creativity and, you know, how we about these two things because they seem to be in some sense dy diametrically opposed <laughs> and yet in other ways uh, if you think in Turing's framework uh, it might be possible so yeah so the Turing thing links up sort of two things for me the first is in terms of creative like automatic creativity mm -hmm. um, it would be really fun to get into some of the like automatic automatic composition things it would have been more kind of like Whitney's thesis actually from last year because there are like sort of similar historical relationships between um, algorithmic composition like Mozart composes things that use dice to you know move stuff around and give up agency to sort of outside sources sometimes machines sometimes nature that was that was the old thesis but no but now um, uh, in terms of the Turing test though there are actually concerts that they would give at the time which would have the reproducing piano here um, and you would have the pianist over here and they would go and sit at the piano, and then they would pretend to play, and then they would get up while the thing was still playing. These are all like advertisements, right, in the form of concerts, like all concerts. And they would, um, and they would come and stand over here, and they would keep playing. And you go, oh my gosh, that's amazing, because there's something like, visual about seeing, about seeing the guy there. There's this thing, the ghosts of the of the player on the hand. You go, oh man, now he's there and he's here, and there are amazing accounts of this. They happen with the phonograph, also actually. With the phonograph, there's this question of like 
really? Like, do you believe that? That a 1910 phonograph sounds exactly like an operatic tenor on stage? Like, there's no way that that could possibly be true. Whereas with the piano, there's this other weird effect where pianos sound like pianos. So the way it sounds different, like sort of, this is another thing that I get to talk about in the presentation, or the, the, the thesis, not the presentation, is fidelity. So what does fidelity mean? Faithfulness in tympanic reproduction is about this kind of sound waves in the air being exactly the same in two different places. Whereas this kind of fidelity is weirder. It's like something about interpretation. So now you need to be true to someone's hands as opposed to true to their ears. And so what does that mean to be you know, faithful to some famous pianist's interpretation. And it's an open question. I mean, they don't really figure it out. Then there's there's a great uh, great thing where, uh, so the, the, when they automate the dynamics, they have to do it in steps, right? They have all these bellows that you can either collapse all the bellows or certain numbers, combinations of the bellows. It's actually a ternary code that's on the side of the, uh, on the side of the roll that tells you which <coughs> bellows to turn on or not. And at one model can do 16 le levels of nuance or whatever. And they're trying to get this pianist to come and record for them. They say, you have to record for a duo art. We're the best. We have 16 levels of nuance. And he says, sorry, I play with 17 levels of nuance. <laughs> and so there's this interesting uh, gap, right, between how machines do things and how people do things that they're constantly trying to overcome. And if I was able to give a million presentations and talk about this new company, this Zen company that does the robotic pianos, where instead of having 16 levels of, of nuance, they now have 300 levels of nuance, and you think, maybe that is enough. Like, what happens now if that's actually enough levels of nuance? And so, yeah, so the issues are, it's persistent. I can't imagine it'll ever stop, although you really feel like, how can you get any better than the ones they have now? But I'm sure that that is true then as well. Maybe. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, just some free association. One yes. is uh, the uncanny valley. You know, in, ro in robotics, they try to yeah. uh, to think about this ghost in our hands. Like you reproduce not just music, you produce a human playing music. So basically, it's a, it's very anthropomorphic. They try to simulate a human uh, with the machines as a system. I think it's, it's very interesting because and it brings this idea of presence, maybe the humanness and uncanniness bring yeah. this idea of presence that we lose with uh, speakers and uh, and panic. So I, I think there is something very interesting here, and also I cannot not think of Mai Wadenki, you know, this Japanese uh, uh, performer. No. They are, they are like they, they use like twenty guitars that they operate with. Uh, oh. They have this thing, the knocker, that, that is just seen, you know yeah. doing this on guitar. And so there, are there is still research in Japan. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, well, there is there is uh, one of those robotic pianos in the building. I forgot how appropriate it is to do this in the Media Lab because there is all sorts of stuff that comes into this from you know the Media Lab itself in terms of performance with you know, opera of the future, this kind of stuff. Um, but as far as eeriness goes, there is a question of eeriness with speakers also, and again with the telephone, the radio. All of this question about like, are there ghosts in these like weird, this can reproduce what people can do, therefore it's this like uncanny version of a person, <coughs> therefore there are ghosts. Um, so this is the most common thing you can imagine, like in the ads, it's just like the piano, and not only is the piano <coughs> player a ghost, but it's in this person's home and they're dancing, if you've been to the Haunted Mansion in, at Disneyland, they're dancing ghosts in the air in this person's house while the person is playing in the advertisement, and this is good, right, like I bring all these ghosts because, you know, that's how real it is. But it's curious what is to have a robot playing a a real anthropomorphic robot. Oh, yeah. so yeah, so I forgot to say that. There's That's the other thing that's interesting, I think, about this and about the way that we think about sound reproduction. So there's this sort of teleological model of sound reproduction where, like, uh, on a large level, tympanic reproduction is the best because it's pure. It's just exactly the sounds in the air, so it's completely neutral. But then there's this question of, you know, the, C, the, the CD is better than the record, you know, blah, 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 um, is better than the wire recorder. But there's all these, like, different things that are better than other things. And it, people forget that there's more than one way to do stuff, right? Like just because one of these is successful doesn't mean that everything else sucks. Uh, so there are more than one way to make an automatic piano. And some of the ways that people did that, usually prior to this, is with, uh, is with androids, right? So you have Marie Antoinette has a, has a piano playing android that's in a museum somewhere in Europe now that plays the piano. And you think, okay, that's interesting because automatic pianos aren't just one thing. The same way that sound reproduction is actually not just one thing. Like you could make, um, one of the quotes that I put up in my last presentation at the beginning of the year was someone arguing for the player piano by saying the piano is an automatic hammer dulcimer anyway, right? Like there are strings in the in the in the dulcimer you hit them with hammers. The piano lets you hit eighty eight strings with eighty eight hammers in exactly the same way every time. So lucky you. 
And now this is just an automatic, automatic dulcimer, and so on. But the automatic, automatic dulcimer could be a lot of things. There are actually automatic dulcimers, right? Like that, that's another way to do it, would be to have a little person go, and they, you know, they're an Android, and they hit the things with cameras. So I'm, this is about, not about like replacing tympanic reproduction or claiming some like other alternate like trunk of history, but basically making a thicker sort of uh, more multifarious kind of uh, of his media history, specifically in this in this time period when stuff is really thick. And there's this idea that this was his, because it's obsolete now; it's always been obsolete. And so the people who use the player piano then must have been dumb or something because they they didn't realize that that is ridiculous. You know, so there's this interesting uh, that's part of the historical work, I guess. Yes. Oh yeah. And um, with the music box came um, some bloody sheets, right? And uh, a whole bunch. And um, you know, I play with it with my daughter, and I can't play a piano, but I find that you know I can sort of make music with this little sheet and a whole bunch. I was wondering if there was sort of a if you have evidence for like the emergence of hobbyists sort of making this device making make music making more accessible, like actually sort of composition. Yeah, you know, playing with there is a device, a home perforator, that you could get 19 teens, maybe even a little bit earlier, um, that was going to be actually a focus of the thesis before. I cut, I had to keep cutting this, but there's this, it's a home perforator and it has a music stand on it, so it's sort of intended for you to make your own roles for music other people have already composed. Um, and this elaborate, they have like different models, right? There's the little portable one, it's the like iPhone or whatever for, for you to like bring to your friend's house and there's the like bigger home one that goes in a cabinet and then you put the music on it it's got a fancy little ornate stand and you there's a, a puncher that it's actually ratcheted across so it only will punch um, you know right on where the holes are supposed to be and then only it's ratcheted this way too so only on like you know divisions of the notes so that you don't have to worry about sloppy timing and then there's a big one that's for like classrooms and I have these amazing pictures of music teachers with all of these little kids punching rolls, and I'm not sure what that was supposed to do, but it's an interesting thought, right? Like I, I mentioned that with those sort of hybrid things like this, this is about making music legible to people, and there's some sense in which this is what music is, and this is not what music is, and that's a whole a whole extra question. But in the, in the classroom, there's this weird thought that maybe there was some motion towards saying, actually, maybe music can be this, and like, you know, legibility is relative, so like you could learn how to figure this out. And people do things when they print like loops on this to say, like, here's a phrase, so you can sort of, you know, there's this like very hand motiony kind of bottom of musical expression where it's like phrases and uh, there's a, a, a technology called audiographic rolls where they print uh, music appreciation stuff on it. So on the one hand it'll have the words, on the other hand it'll have this person who you don't know who it is, it's some kind of expert telling you stuff about the music. It's like, and get ready, the bells are coming, and it's the part that sounds like the bells, and it says one, two, three, it's the, there's this Rachmaninoff C minor uh, prelude that goes dun, 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 and it says one, two, three, and you imagine this very like crazy-haired music professor like, talking to you. Um, I don't know where that came from, but that, uh, there's something there about education. Yes. Also, oh, sorry. Also, sorry, also size that like um, visualizing the computer code as well. Yeah. Right. They're just trying to make these machine-readable things more readable to humans, and it's just a sign that like legibility is complicated, right? It's not just about knowing how to read or being able to read something. I was yeah. just, I'm talking legibility. I feel like I recall reading something and talking to you about the fact that the roles were potentially legible if you were, if you were, you know. I mean, there's really 88 you know, holes. There's 88 holes. Like, I mean, if do I have them? Well, you, you, I mean, conceivably, you could learn to read I'm anything. I'm just wondering, like, how they print. Those things on it in the correct places. If it is true that it's completely it's good, humans, right? Well, like, you can see that this is like uh, this doesn't really matter if it's exactly right. Well, like, yeah. like, there's nothing, you know, even there. Yes. There's sort of a mess. Um, there are certain ones where the notes are supposed to be like right on the holes, and then they actually want to change it because so the rolls normally go down like this. And there are a lot of inventions. People got different patents for the same thing. Basically, it's like let's turn this sideways because um, now you can actually read. Again, reading only happens sideways, not up right. and down. So if it moves across this way, then you can see the music and help you print. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think people could read it. There's this idea that it's I possible, just, right? I feel like it's even the given. Yeah, I think so. There's this question like you can you could train to do it, and the music roll 
uh, people wanted to say, no, you can't do it right, in the court. Yeah. But then they yeah. wanted to be like, in all the, all of the brochures, they make, it's like, you have to really learn how to interpret it because you can be a bad pianist. And if you don't know how to tell when a phrase is about to end, you may slam the pedal down really hard and hit some note that's supposed to be quiet, super loud, and wouldn't that be yeah. really embarrassing? <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so that's, a, that's definitely and well, so the, sort of parallel to that is with the phonograph. And there's a question of like, can you read phonographic grooves? And this is well done by a lot of other sound studies people. But like, maybe if I look at it close enough, I can learn. It, it comes out of this like sound writing thing. Lisa Gittleman writes about this also, where like the cone vibrates a thing and it draws you like, this is what an A looks like. And they go, mm, I can't tell. And they try to draw one out and they're like, oh, I don't know if that looks the same. Um, and then there are artists again who are like, maybe we can make our own music directly on the phonograph. Right, like pure, we can make it straight, like just into pure sound, because you can etch your own little groove. Sort of true on the computer now, I guess. Synthesis. Sorry. <laughs> I may be. I may be done. Uh, time for one more question. Hey. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this this may not be the scope of what you were looking at, but you sort of talked about the difference between live and actually like the idea of re-performance, right? After yeah. There. Um, and you even said you know that you could examine it in the frame of, of kind of tympanic. Uh, reproduction, right? Kind of like we're, we're looking at how we hear things. Um, do you look at, um, you know, like audience or perhaps context in which we listen to things, right? Because I can play an instrument to myself. <laughs> you might not call that live music. <laughs> I can also turn on the automated machine and leave the room. Is that a performance anymore, right? I mean, right. It, it's kind of a, a silly philosophical, like if no one's there listening to it, it's a performance anymore. Like, yeah, right? <laughs> There's a machine doing it anyway, right? So I think, um, and that's, a, that's an interesting question, because a lot of this is, is for me, about the sort of source of these. And I hadn't actually thought about going to that other side, about like the audience side of it, where tympanic reproduction is not defined by how you listen to it so much as by how it's made. And of course, it's made thinking that you're going to listen to it in certain ways. This, a similar, a similar kind of thing. They both have their context that they've come from. I haven't thought much about the audience. What I will say is that there is a lot of thought while this is bit oh, that I can put this. This is based on the biology of the ear, like Helmholtz in the nineteenth century. You know, they say, how does the ear work? They think like this. Let's make some things. Um, the the pianolas are based on technology that has to be built around a music science that doesn't exist yet. You can't believe the pianists. They don't know what they're saying, even though they're they're beautiful players and you want to do exactly what they do. Um, but there's these labs that pop up and there's the section I didn't get to talk about is objectivity, which I really like, which is how do you measure performance? How do you decide what the salient parts are? How do you decide in what ways they're salient? Um, and it's a lot of science. Uh, that little device that I showed, that's uh, the this thing, is part of that. It's like, how do we measure what the piano does? Because is it the speed of the hammer that makes it louder, or is it the speed the key goes down? Are those the same? Or maybe it's different across the whole piano? So there's this characterizing of the piano as a scientific object that I think is really interesting because we made them. Like they're not, it's like you found it in the woods and you go, how does this thing work? But it's a strangely familiar yet defamiliar kind of 